In a world spiraling into darkness and chaos, only a handful dare to stand up and push back against the insanity that is quickly shadowing and extinguishing what's left of light and truth. In this No Holds Barred podcast with truth directly from the word, Michael is one such voice, punching through this darkness to dispel the deception and lies being pushed on this planet from all sides. Buckle up, place your trays in the upright position, enjoy the ride. Bullet Points As most of what's left of the church that even bother to discuss biblical topics with others are either out pushing some pre-scenario of their escape plan in one form or another or spiraling off into hours of endless debate of a flat versus ball earth thousands of our brothers and sisters are out there sitting in the dark with no clue as to what's truly coming and just how it's all going to play out according to scripture when the curtain goes up yes that was a bit of sarcasm there as the shepherds have thrown the truth of what's about to occur in end times into sheer confusion for simply entertainment it appears in most cases as they roll the dollars in the end result doesn't change just ask some of the hundreds of flat earthers out there for example as if it even really matters whether it's flat or round. But just simply ask them this or that from the timeline of events laid out in the word in the chronology of the seals, trumpets, and vials. Or about the entities that are going to take the stage. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. We've put some serious chinks in the armor of both the pre-tribulation rapture believers as well as those who hold to a pre-wrath scenario. Though I'm certain neither group is convinced just yet. If in their being taught by their shepherds these theologies, they themselves never once realize that the church, the ecclesia, is not complete until the tribulation saints, as they call them, those left behind, that they, every last man, woman, and child here on earth during the final 1260 days, that they are also given their time to make the choice as to whether or not they are going to choose to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the beast. And it's then and only then that the resurrection of the dead in Christ and the catching up of those still alive and remaining can take place that they say occurred seven years prior, that it's at this point that the church, the ecclesia, is complete the question still remains, how can we help them? Well, we're certainly going to try here on bullet points, that's for sure. Pressing on, I've lightly mentioned the standard pre-wrath view of a rapture and where in this theology the sixth seal is slid out to anywhere from just past the midpoint to near the very end end of the final 1260 days just prior to Jesus second coming and consequently in the first podcast we fired the kill shots on that view as well how by correctly linking the six seventh seals to the first 1290 days given us by Daniel and we'll be looking deeper into the times mentioned in the prophetic scriptures as we move forward in these podcasts correctly placing the seals trumpets and vials on this timeline so as to paint a clear target for you coming around the bend from where we started though most don't connect all we've covered thus far to matthew 24 alone shoot 
as I said in the last podcast, one group throws it out completely. And the other group, well, certainly it's at their core of their theology. But then with that one magic word, rapture, spin off into total chaos from what the word is really saying is to come. I wonder if anyone in either group has ever bothered to even look up the root word etymology of rapture. Hmm. Several times I've mentioned these dots that we're connecting. The sixth seal, Matthew 24, 29 through 31, and into Revelation 12 as also being connected. And that this is where we are heading to as one of our major destinations in understanding the truth of the word and in dragging deceptive teaching, kicking and screaming into the light. This one's going to be a wild ride. So let's dig in with both hands and see if these things I've said in the first podcasts be so. Matthew 24 that chapter that everyone loves to talk about, but seem to throw the understanding of it into a ninja blender for some reason. And a fair warning here. Please put your thinking caps on and put down your presuppositions for just a little while and let your ears help you to see. Beginning in verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Stop the bus. It's right here that my request that I've asked of you to put on your thinking caps and put down any presuppositions that you're bringing to the table needs to begin. In this podcast, we're going to really begin to look through the scope to understand these verses and see just what it is that Jesus was telling his disciples and us for that matter. Therefore, in the definition of this one word, we begin to cite in all that is to come from Matthew 24 and much of the rest of prophetic texts as far as timing goes that will bear the greatest effect on both those in Judea and the rest of the world when the curtain goes up. Definition 1a For that reason... Consequently, 1B, because of that, 1C, on that ground, 
too. To that end. And continuing, therefore, wherefore, accordingly, consequently, so, then, all introduce a statement resulting from, or caused by, what immediately precedes. That's key right there. Let me continue. Therefore, for this or that reason, and wherefore, for which reason, imply exactness of reasoning. They are especially used in logic, law, mathematics, etc., and in a formal style of speaking or writing. Accordingly, in conformity with the preceding, and consequently, as a result or sequence or effect of the preceding. Although also somewhat formal, occur mainly in less technical contexts. So because the preceding is true or this being the case, and then since the preceding is true are informal or conversational in tone with one simple word, that most read right over it, never taking the time to even look at it or understand its usage in a sentence. For decades have been erroneously taught that all the events in Matthew 24 are played out in sequential order. Or in other words, that verses 5 through 15 occur one verse after the other. But as we just heard in the definition of therefore, we're left with no other choice here but to begin and properly apply it into what Jesus said in these verses. Now, this isn't rocket science, and I'm certainly not trying to demean anyone's intelligence levels in what I'm saying here, but basic grammar in the use of an adverb cannot be ignored here. Maybe some who will listen to this podcast have already figured this out for themselves, and I'm preaching to the choir in their cases. But in all the years I've studied biblical end times, I've never once came across anyone who ever pointed this out in their teachings. And it's key critical in understanding the rest of Matthew 24 and how it's all playing out in conjunction with the entirety of prophetic scripture For those who have not come to understand the timing of the events Jesus is speaking of and correct those who think they already have figured it out. Right here, let's do some paraphrasing to put what Jesus is saying into perspective. When, because of everything I just got done telling you is going to happen to you, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, it's high time to hightail it out of town. Therefore, in this one word is the trigger here that we're looking at and is opened up in paraphrasing it as Because of everything I just got done telling you in verses 6 through 15 that is going to happen to you. That's what therefore does in its usage in a sentence. The preceding is going to happen as a result of the revealing. Let's try it another way because this is what Jesus is relaying to us. And to stress it further, has to be understood so as to truly understand the context of Jesus' words. Beginning in verse 15, when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. 
and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Yes, you heard that right. Though it might not have registered just yet, all that Jesus just got finished explaining to his disciples that is going to befall those in Judea in verses 9 through 14 hinges off of therefore. We could go on for an hour running it this way and that, but I would instead suggest, listen again to what I've said so far. Look at the word for yourself. Take some time to read it through and see that verses 9 through 14 that precede verse 15 are because of the abomination of desolation showing up on the holy place by the use of one word, therefore. And it's then and only then that Jesus' words in verse 21 ring true. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. That tribulation is described once again in verses 9 through 13. This has to be understood before the believer is going to start understanding exactly what is happening in prophetic events as they unfold on the timeline. I can't stress this enough. And it's here I throw out a disclaimer. Remember from the previous podcasts and what has been pointed out thus far? At this point in the events, Jesus explaining to us, we haven't even gotten to the sixth seal yet. That is detailed in verse 29 of the self-same chapter of Matthew 24. And we won't even mention here. Okay, we are mentioning it. Satan and one-third of the stars aren't even here yet at this point, and the final 1260 days has not even begun. And by default, in our sliding up to the point the abomination of desolation walks up onto the Temple Mount, let me throw this in here. The writers of the first four seals we covered in the first podcast, well, They're right here as well in these verses in Matthew 24, specifically in verses 5 through 8. In the beginning of sorrows, as Jesus said in our KJV, or birth pangs, depending on your translation. Let's read them real quick for reference. Verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now listen. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Yep. These verses, 5 through 8, play out in the first half of the seven-year tribulation, as it's predominantly titled, in the first 1290 days. And it's right there. Please go and read the first four seals and listen for rising up one against another. War, pestilence, earthquakes, and that fourth rider, death and hell. Listen closely when you read. Now all this flies right in the face of some theologies being taught that try and slide all the times ascribed in Daniel and Revelation all into the last portion of times and we'll cover all this more in depth later in this series. Don't miss it. Once again, verses 5 through 8 are when the craftsmen, a.k.a. the carpenters, the riders of the four horses of the apocalypse, those angelic entities we covered in the first podcast, are riding to prevent the horns of the Gentiles from being able to achieve what? Their new world order, the NWO, which by God's account never 
was ordained. Now, I know that falls in direct polar opposite of so much teaching you've gotten in years past from the Christian entertainment industry. So let me be clear. A new world order, a never was ordained, will not be accomplished until he who shall ascend out of the bottomless pit at the fifth trumpet arrives on the scene. And we'll get to this as well. That will be the only new world order to rise. And the world's going to get a kick out of him. More on that later for sure. Here, let me fire a couple of quick shots downrange for consideration. When the abomination of desolation is seen standing in the holy place, let's hop over to 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Yes. Matthew 24, 15, and these verses from 2 Thessalonians 2 are a parallel set of verses. The revealing of the man of sin who will become the false prophet happens when he is seen standing in the holy place, not some three and a half years prior to this event as a certain theology proposes. Let me say that once more. The revealing of the man of sin who will become the false prophet happens when he is seen standing in the holy place, not three and a half years prior to this event. And mind you, this is only one, as we covered previously, of the dynamic duo, as I've called them in the first couple podcasts. The revealing I refer to here is of the man, the man of sin, who most, as I've said, want to call the, air quotes, Antichrist. And we've already put the kibosh on that one, as he's only half of who is to come, and in time will become the false prophet unto his little g God, after his little g God ascends out of the bottomless pit, otherwise known in the word as the beast. And we're going to get to all that as well. One more quick shot downrange. Many have heard and taught of the destruction of two-thirds of the Jews with the refining of the other one-third as we read in Zechariah 13. Well, Jesus is speaking of the timing of these exact events right here in Matthew 24. Seriously speaking, not a good time by any means for those in Judea. And we'll get deeper into it in casts to come. Getting back on point. In the verses following, verse 15, in light of all Jesus said was going to happen to them as a result of verses 9 through 14, Jesus begins explaining what those in Judea should do right when the abomination of desolation is seen ascending the holy place. In verses 16 through 20, Jesus is explaining that with the AOD's arrival, where they must go. Verse 16, then let them which be in Judea flee unto the mountains. Then Jesus adds the urgency of not delaying their getting out of town. Verse 17, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. 
neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Quick shot right here. Verse 19, very prophetic in and of itself. More on that later as well. Back on point. Verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. There are some days, Jesus explains, of great tribulation that will come from him, this abomination that causes desolation, and what is to befall those in Judea upon his arrival, and that if those days were not cut short, no one would survive. Let's listen to Jesus himself speak these words. For then, verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Those days. When we dig into the times mentioned in Daniel, these times line up with all Jesus is telling us here. Let's take a listen from Daniel 12, beginning in verse 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Verse 11 tells us that from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, up unto the abomination of desolation being set up, that 1290 days will transpire between these two events like bookmarks. Now, many different theologies have these two events chronicled here as occurring at the exact same time. And some of these self-same theologies even slide the 1290 days as occurring in the final half of Daniel's 70th week, a.k.a. the seven-year tribulation, that we just covered Jesus saying that the time of great tribulation doesn't begin until the AOD shows up. And we haven't even gotten in all of this happening, as I said earlier, to the sixth seal event at this point where we're now at. And then in verse 12 we get this mention of the blessing for those who wait and come to this 1335th day. Now, some theologies interpret this 1335th day as the second coming of Jesus and rapture. But we're going to see that it's an event altogether different than the resurrection rapture as they erroneously claim it is. It certainly can be called a relocation event. It's just that it's not off planet that the destination of this relocation event takes those who make it alive to this day. This right here we're discussing right now is the truth that has been hijacked and it spirals off into the biggest deception ever pulled on the church body. The rapture comes with a blinding of the eyes. Voodoo, if you will. I think the Apostle Paul ascribed it best. Who hath bewitched you? Now, I'm not saying that the resurrection slash catching up of those still alive and remaining isn't going to happen. 
Don't twist what I'm saying so as to hold on to your preconceived theology. Because what I'm saying is all the confusion of what is occurring with the truth of those angels being dispatched to gather the elect in Matthew verse 31, 24, 31. That truth has been hijacked and twisted entirely into an event and action that it is not. Stick around if you want to find out what the truth of what this event, in fact, is in podcasts to come. And we might even touch on it a little here in a minute or two. So we've got 45 days from the time that the abomination of desolation ascends the Temple Mount until someone is getting blessed. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, that the abomination of desolation is going to be standing in the holy place. Daniel parallels Jesus when he ascribed a specific time of when the AOD is in that selfsame place, but worded it as set up. 1290 days once again between these two points and those making it to the 1335th day are blessed once again 45 days of a time of great tribulation that has never been and no nor ever shall be again where what Remember verses 9 through 14 we covered? These 45 days are the days of great slaughter. And except these 45 days be cut short by that 1335th day that some special blessing is going to happen, no flesh would be saved. A rapture you've been taught? Is that what that blessing of the 1335th day Daniel spoke of is? Not quite. So now we're up to verse 23. These verses are explanatory verses telling the reader what would occur in the form of deceptions in those days that need to be cut short. Verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And quick note, it's only going to be possible if you don't dig into the word of the Lord your God, write it upon your heart, and get understanding of what is to come and how it all plays out as opposed to the entertainment, shall we say. Verse 25, Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Let me stop right here. Remember Jesus' disciples asked him in verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came up unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus goes on to explain to them so that they, us, would not be deceived that all these events and the claims that will come out of it were him and his coming. He tells them, us, exactly what his coming will look like, as is detailed in Revelation 19. That's that's his coming. Remember, we covered some of the uh, Matthew 24 is not for us claims in the last podcast. Well, I guess you'd have to have been bewitched to think Jesus' words here are not for us as well. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. And we covered that as well. I think it was last week. Those cadavers, 
dead bodies. Hmm. As I stated earlier, these verses from 23 to 28 are describing what will be going on in those days when the AOD shows up. And then Jesus goes on to tell us just how his coming from the heavens would look for us down here. Then it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the ones that need to be cut short, mind you, those 45 days, just after those days, the sixth seal will be cracked and the gathering together of the elect will occur via the angels just a short time later, just as Jesus said. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, does anybody remember Jesus speaking in Matthew 13? Matthew 13 and 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Matthew 13, 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. Did you catch that? These verses in Matthew 13 are parallel verses to Matthew 24, 31. This is the harvest, the time of the threshing floor. Not to be confused with the resurrection of the dead in Christ and the catching up of those alive and remaining. This, catch this now, this once again is the truth that has been hijacked. I'm telling you, you're going to want to stick around for this series if you want the truth, that is. This podcast could go on for literally hours, but it's right here that I would point out to the listener. Get your Bible out and read through the parenthetical verses of Revelation 14 if you really want to hear about this harvest of the threshing floor where the reapers, the angels, will be dispatched to gather together the wheat from the tares all in preparation for the arrival of the beast and the only world order that is ever going to be established on this earth, though for a very short time. Yes, Matthew twenty four thirty one, with the angels gathering the elect. Jesus' words in Matthew 13 about the harvest of the wheat and the tares. Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20, and for the record, nearly every single parable Jesus spoke is all speaking of this exact event. Jesus didn't speak once of a pre-tribulation rapture, not even a pre-wrath rapture. He did, however, speak of the threshing floor and the harvest of the wheat from the tares many times over. But the barn the wheat is gathered into, well, it's not heaven. Remember, I said the relocation event a few minutes back? Think about it. Where in Revelation do we hear of a relocation event that doesn't end up in rapture? And backing up just a wee bit, for the record, a bullet point here, the end of the world that we've heard in a couple verses now, parenthesis around world. 
both here in the verses we covered in Matthew 13 and in Matthew 24, verse 3. Let's hear it again. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The word here, underlying world from the Greek, is eon or age. It's the end of the age. The world does not end, per se, not right here anyway. Summing it up, how long do those days that need to be cut short when the AOD shows up and begins the slaughter, the days of great tribulation, how long do they last before the sixth seal is cracked and the angels are sent forth to gather the elect? 45 days. Everything Jesus said that we've covered thus far is up unto the AOD arriving and occurs in the first half of Daniel's 70th week. I mean, most agree with that. And then he goes on to explain the details of his arrival, the revealing and the deceptions surrounding it and where those in Judea are to flee to. And immediately what? After this attack, the sixth seal will be opened. And now remember, this is termed by most a seven-year tribulation. And riding with that, we're only sliding up to the halfway point in all Jesus has said here so far. So if you say 1,260 days after the AOD's arrival are the days that are to be cut short, in comparison to the 1290 days and insert a 30 day window into this equation. And it is then when the six seal is cracked or some mumbo jumbo. I've read all kinds of different commentary on this from the pre rathers. Well, you failed. See you soon. Bullet points.